ثانك يو طيب in the name of the father son the holy spirit one god amen as you know we are now in the great lent and there is something in the great lent we may notice in the church especially on the days not sunday saturday and sunday but the other days if you come early in the starting of the liturgy in the raising of the incense you're going to see that we are adding something more than what we do during the year which is the prophecies yeah. prophecies are parts from the old testament and they are selected in to give like you know contribute to the meaning of the readings in general of the whole uh, of the whole day okay and of the whole week and of the whole time of the lent so they were selected in purpose to build a certain idea that uh, all the readings are leading to and these prophecies are from the name by the name prophecy is from the old testament so they are prophecies from parts from the old testament and most of the time i'm sure that you all have experienced that when you read these prophecies you end up by saying something like this i don't know it's, <laughs> it's recorded here yeah huh? which means i don't know and not only those people who listen and here's the prophecies but the one who's reading also probably will end up saying the same thing i don't know so if i ask you sometimes when you read any prophecies in the morning in the in the prayer and if you don't understand don't be surprised no you're not the only one <laughs> you're not the only one prophecies are not an easy thing to understand and it's not meant to because if God want to tell us something, he was going to say it directly. But the prophecy is not like something you can just read it and take the face value and you say, oh, it's easy. He said so and so. No, it's not. That's, that's why it's not a prophecy. The prophecy is something I would say even the prophet who is saying the prophecy, probably he doesn't understand the meaning of what he's saying. Because the prophecy is about something that probably will happen later. Uh, it is indicating the will of God. It, is, it has some, and some prophecies have uh, like specific things that are going to happen in the future. So probably the prophet himself, when he's saying that, it's not in his mind at all. But the Holy Spirit, he is the one, God, God is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who have inspired the whole Bible from the Old and the New Testament. And the Holy Spirit is the one who was leading Moses and Isaiah and all the prophets of the Old Testament, while they are writing, and even in the New Testament too, who are writing the Holy Bible. So we, that's why we say the prophecy is the say of the Holy Spirit. The prophecy is the words of God. And not always easy to understand what God want to say, but there are something are going to happen in the future, or there are some warnings or something. So the prophecy put in a way to make it like uh, attract the, the attention of the people to, to see what is this. Okay. And the prophet is, is a human like you and me like that. So sometimes even the prophet himself, while he was saying or writing these things, doesn't understand it maybe under maybe the holy spirit will declare it to him or whatever but it could happen later but as you hear or you read in, in the bible that you say and the spirit of god was upon isaiah he said so and so were upon a person and he did or said something so at that time the person is under the 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 the, the power or the authority of the holy spirit when he's saying that but in the meantime he is not absent no it's not like a person absent totally complete that when some is possessed by unclean spirit and you see that this person is talking in a different language he doesn't know the whole the, the, the unclean spirit probably took the, the with some authority he took the will of the person and took all the um, faculties of the person and started to use them without his own will. 
That's why you see the one who has unclean spirit. He may swear, he may say different words and different language or things like that, because he's not, he doesn't have any authority on what he's saying. Of course, the, the prophet under the authority of the Holy Spirit is not like that. But the Holy Spirit is guiding the prophet to say, to write the prophecies. That's why we say all the prophecies in the Bible are guided by and inspired by the Holy Spirit. So even Isaiah, Moses, Jeremiah, or any other prophet is saying that, but these are the sayings of the Holy Spirit. And you can see the prophets in many places in the Old Testament saying, and the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, telling me to say or to do or to be sent. He realized that it is not me who is saying that, but the authority of God, God's glory is telling me or telling me to tell you so and so and so. So the, the Holy Spirit uses the faculties of the person and his own will. Like you, you can see some prophets like Isaiah were like a people who were intellectual people, well-educated uh, people who can will to say. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit used them to say a prophecy. There are other prophets who are very simple farmers and people who are not well-educated, who are counted, but the Holy Spirit used them also to say the prophecies and to do. So regardless of the person, and his qualities and that, but the Holy Spirit uses that. In the New Testament, the same thing. St. Paul was a very well-educated person in many different languages, and the Holy Spirit used him to write books in the New Testament. There are simple, uh, St. Peter was a fisherman, but the Holy Spirit also used him to. So the Holy Spirit will use the person with his own faculty, education, intellectual uh, qualities, etc., and guide him to write what the Holy Spirit what the, to, to guide to write what God wants to tell us or to say to us, not only the people who listen at that time and see from the prophet, but the people over the generation. That's why uh, the Bible is for every generation, not only for the people who are listening to Isaiah or Jeremiah. Many of the prophecies were like something that will happen in the future. And many of them happened already. Actually, our faith is that all the prophecies of the Old Testament were directed to point to Jesus and his incarnation is coming. And by his incarnation and birth, all these prophecies were fulfilled. So don't go now today in the Old Testament and say, oh, the, there is a prophecy about the uh, land of Egypt and about what will happen to the river Nile. And oh, this is about the... Uh, uh, the, the, the dam that they are building in Ethiopia and or something happened here or oh, this is the war between Iran and no, 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 no. Don't misuse the prophecies. The prophecies we're pointing to at, at when you we read the word at that day at that day is re repeated many times in the Old Testament at that day means the day that God incarnated and was born and came and in the time of Jesus, yeah. So all the prophecies were leading to Jesus, and Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies. Unless there are some prophecies that were mentioned specifically, oh, the African book of Daniel, there are about two or three prophecies, and at that time, God told Daniel, oh, these prophecies are for the end of the days. So this is clear, it is something, and they are speaking about the end of the days, which is the end of the world again. In the New Testament, there are uh, prophecies too. There is a book of prophecy in the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation. Because actually when St. John, when he was writing these things, as you know, the, the Holy Spirit tell him to write these things, and probably he didn't understand what he was seeing or writing at that time. But like all of us, but these things are going to happen and it will happen. And when it happened, we're going to understand it clearly. Oh, this is exactly what St. John said in the book of Revelation when it's happen it happens. Okay. We don't try to twist the, the prophecies now to tell what we want to see now.
That is a wrong approach. So don't do that. When you read the book of Revelation, read the book of the uh, book of Revelation for your spiritual benefit. Yes, you may you may not understand literally the words, but there is spiritual meanings that will help us to benefit spiritually when we read that. But I'm not talking about the book of Revelation now. I'm talking about the prophecies of the Old Testament that uh, there. Why the prophecies are hard to understand? So I tell you, like, when you read, probably you don't understand directly as, as you, re you read the newspaper or something like that, or any book of uh, medicine or engineering or whatever you're studying. Yeah. So why the prophets are not clear? You have any suggestion? Oh, sorry. I'm just trying to... Um, go, go ahead. Have. The prophecy is there from the Old Testament? Is it... No, there are prophecies in the New Testament also with the book of Revelation. But most of the prophecies are in the Old Testament. And all of these prophecies pointing to uh, that day or whatever is always speaking about the Lord. So yes. our Lord Jesus and his incarnation, his birth, his suffering, his resurrection, all of that was the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Okay. So okay. I guess I... But why is the, the prophecy is not something easy to understand as if you're reading the titles of the newspaper or something like that? Yeah. I mean, it... I don't like the wording sometimes is not exact. It's an example of something that means something that would happen. It's mm -hmm. never like clearly like Christ will come through St. Mary or something. It's always, I don't know, it's not exact wording of the thing. So it doesn't make sense. Yes, that's, that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, reasons why? Yes, ma'am. Because it tells the future. It tells the future. Yes, yeah, there are some prophecies are talking about the future. So, of course, when you hear it at that time, don't understand it because it's not happening yet. Or it carry a meaning. It carries a meaning that probably um, something that you don't know it about it at all. So these things probably will talk, or it, you, you may misunderstand it and hear, now oh, maybe he's talking about this or that. Yes, because it is not clear what he's saying, because that's why it is called, it is called the prophecy. That is okay. But do uh, you have any, any other suggestions why it is not easy to understand? And please forgive me for this expression, easy to understand. I'm going to correct it now quickly. I will stay. I remember there's a verse called my ways are not your ways my thoughts are not your thoughts exactly so we cannot understand god bravo bravo Christina, what you said here is that like i will give an example for that mina is a medical doctor if he goes to the university you know classes now and sit down there and hear a doctor saying a lecture about something in the human body He's going to understand what he's saying, right? But if I go there and sit down, it will be a prophecy to me, <laughs> <laughs> right? Lava <laughs> Santa, you were able to interpret the prophecy. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> because you had a background that will tell you what this doctor is saying, and probably you're going to understand uh, clearly what he's saying because of your background, your background. But I don't have that background. So if I sit there, the, all the talking of the doctor will be a prophecy to me. And will never understand unless someone interpreted for me. Right. So it is not like uh, it's difficult. No, it is because I am small in front of this prophecy. So actually, the prophecy, as we just said now a few minutes ago, it is the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of God. And even hatta, if we are so intellectual, so genius, but when we stand in front of God, we're nothing. So it's going to be hard to understand. It's not because that the prophecy is not clear. No, it's not because I can't understand easily something above my ability and my mind. That's why the, the prophecy would look like that. But is it possible that God made that way? Because... Uh, for us not to totally understand it so we don't have to worry about it because if it's clear to us we will always worry about it so when, when it's not that's that's a big way then we don't understand it so it's done uh, mona has a point that's uh, it's meant to be like this 
because you know if, if it is clear to us probably that would shock us right yeah. <laughs> yeah there are some prophets who went and he they said something so clear like jonah for example the city will be destroyed in 40 days. Okay, it doesn't need any interpretation, <laughs> but it's clear. <laughs> so it is hard to, like, it's a shock. So God wanted to tell people things that probably won't look like a shock, but it take, takes time to be grasped, to be understood. Bro, on the flip side, like Jonah's prophecy worked. <laughs> oh, on the flip side, it worked. Like Jonah's prophecy, it made them to repent. But yeah. Isaiah's prophecy, they didn't really repent. They killed him, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. There were other prophecies also in the Old Testament, like one of the kings of uh, descendant of King David. When he heard or read the scriptures, he started to cry and ask the people to, probably the same like the king of Nineveh. But like, and and to, to repent and to do re return all the commandments of the Lord, etc. So it happened in, in other with other people too. But the way I think of it is if God is trying to tell something to somebody and it's very important, like if I was speaking to somebody and I know they're very young and they don't understand, I need to make it as clear as possible so that they understand. I won't be speaking to them in a strange way that they're confused and it's not like like it's not effective communication right because they don't understand they don't really know what to do right and then from my perspective why am i even saying it? right because but i know they don't understand again i will go back again to the same example i used a few minutes ago like if you go and attend any class in the medical school no matter how they try to make it easy simple probably you won't understand. So then, why am I... <laughs> Not you, you yeah, and me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like why is it even being said? If they don't understand it, like if the children... If because, because it was said to teach other people to become doctors. So there is a purpose here. So the prophet doesn't understand. Yes. And the children of Israel don't understand. And, and maybe it's just me, I don't understand. <laughs> well, so, yeah. you have really to go... You have to go and study medicine from the beginning in order. <laughs> no, I, I will going to, I will answer this now. I will come to the another point now, which is the purpose of selecting this or talking here to, tonight. Yeah. The prophecies are some sometimes look hard to understand, but that is not true meaning or true um, un understanding of the prophecies. The prophets are, are not meant to be some, uh, you know, fawazir uh, 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 riddle, yeah. No, God doesn't want to play riddles with us and tell us something that we don't understand, yeah. No, but it is like the uh, uh, hard thing. Nuts, yeah, the kind of nuts, you have a very hard shell. Okay, and it has very something that is very nice and sweet and tasty inside it, but you can't put it under your teeth, it, it might break your teeth if you if you try to do that. Yeah, so you have to get a tool and break it hard in order to get whatever inside to eat it and to see it. Oh, how sweet it is! A prophecy is like that. In the Bible, there are many verses. Huh? No, it's like I was telling somebody. It's like when we were kids, we had a candy called Jawbreakers. That, uh, yes, it's in Sudan. Yeah, they used to bring it in Egypt too. Yeah, they used to bring it, in. I, I saw it in Egypt too. Yeah. So there are many other things like that. Yeah, they are look very hard from outside, and it uh, um, many other things. And I don't remember it, but just this nut is kind of not. Yeah, you can do that, but it is. It's hard. You have to break it in order to get whatever inside it and taste it and see it, how sweet it is. Okay, there are other verses in the Bible, especially in the New Testament and in the Old Testament too, like the book of Proverbs and things like that. They call it like a piece of chocolate, like you put it in your mouth and it's melt. Khalas, it's easy. Yeah, you don't need to break the nut, the shell from outside. You don't have to. But the prophecies compare by the, the, these verses with the prophecies. Yeah, this is like the nut with the hard shell that has the meaning inside. It's sweet, very nice, but you need to break this shell in order to reach that. Here's something like very soft and sweet like chocolate. 
you put it on any in your tongue, it melts and it goes again. So there are verses like in the Bible like that, and this the prophecies are from this kind here. But the, that's what I'm going to say. It is not like a riddle. It's not like something God wanna just complicate things for us. No, God wanna tell us something that's probably above our understanding, which means that we have to struggle. That is breaking the shell in order to reach this nice thing that the Lord is saying. The prophecy also could carry different meanings. Some meaning that just close like a face value. Okay. Well, some meanings are very deep that needs that you pray and study in order to reach this, this meaning there. So uh, the more you read in, in, in the Old Testament, the, the more you struggle to understand and to link verses from here and here, the more you will become expert to get the meaning from the expert in breaking the shell and get the meaning of the, the prophecy. So the, uh, also this is the principle, we have to put it here, like all the prophecies of the Old Testament, if you try to understand them in the light of Christ, you're going to see them much easier than just looking in the darkness. So that's why Jesus told the Jews, search the books and they witness to me. The books at that time were the Old Testament, the prophecies. And that's why there are over 500 prophecies in the Old Testament that speak clearly, easily about Jesus. But when they were said 500 years or a thousand years before that, were like a knot for the people at that time. They couldn't understand. Like when he say, uh, behold, the virgin will conceive and, 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 uh, and give birth to a child. If you are a Jewish person living in the time of Isaiah, thousand years before the birth of Christ, and you hear this, what is it? You don't even have to be. Even Simon, no. huh? Simon the, 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 the writer, when he was translating this 200 years before the birth of Christ, he couldn't believe it, and he tried to change the world. Tell you know, God, you know, <laughs> intervene and, and make him to write it the same way, and told them, "You're not gonna die till you see this," and it happens. Yeah. So there are things that probably were in the Old Testament; they were like a knot you can't understand. But all these things, when you shed the light of Christ, you can understand it very easily. And this is not the only prophecy, but there are many, many other prophecies like that. For us now, knowing Christ in the New Testament, for us, they are very clear and very easy to understand. But for the people who hear that before Jesus, to them was a knot, and this was hard, probably for Isaiah himself, yeah, to understand these things. But the Holy Spirit was guiding him to write that. And later, when Jesus came, all these, and this is not the only prophecies, there are lots of, maybe a thousand prophecies in the Old Testament that were directly speaking about Jesus and his actions, his incarnation, etc., etc., and they were fulfilled completely in the time of Jesus. Of course, Mason, in the Old Testament, there is a prophecy in Isaiah 40, it's speaking about Messiah, when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. It never happened, but it happened when Jesus opened the eyes of the blind man. That's why the blind man said it was never here that a, a blind man can see before. But he did that. Then he is the Messiah. It was the Old Testament said that the Messiah will do that. And then the Jews were furious for him and said, you're, teach, you're, you're teaching us. You know, he's, he's saying simple thing. Messiah in the Old Testament. The Old Testament said that he's going to open the eyes of the blind. Never happened. Today it happened. I was a blind, I can see. Then one equal one equal plus one equal two. If he opened my eyes, then he is the Messiah. They didn't like that. And then why did he kick him outside and said, you're teaching us? You know? <laughs> so anyway, that is the prophecy. Again, uh, the, the bright point here is that the prophecy has a very nice meanings and when we study the old testament and understand it we see together that your mind is uh, you know like have a lamp that lead lamp that bring, bring all the light yeah yeah and you know this is a way in cartoon like when somebody understands something like you see draw like a lamp over his head. <laughs> 
<تصفيق> يعني احنا when we understand the prophecies is like that we're gonna see the lamb <تصفيق> ايوه okay, I have a question sure is prophecy meant for everybody or just for the prophets mm, a good question what do you think Because the prophecy is the prophecy meant for everybody or only for the prophet or probably for the people around them at the time yeah. to interpret the prophet mm. what do you think do you have any answer input aren't we all involved in the prophecy hmm? aren't, aren't we all involved in that prophecy no he, she's saying is that the prophecy for everyone or for the people that they hear it directly at the time all the ages. Huh? It's for all the ages. For all the no, I, no, it is for all ages, but is it for everybody to, to interpret it and understand, or is it for just certain person that would help us to understand it? There is a verse in the Bible, St. Paul said this verse that all the Bible is written for our own benefits, we who are living in the end of generation. So the word we are living in the end of generation applies to everyone because everyone was living in the end of the generation when he was living or she was living, right? So I live now in the 20th century. This is the end of generation, okay, or 21th century. People who were living in the 10th century, that was the end of generation for them. And the whole Bible were, was written for their own benefit. People who were living in the first century, first century was the end of generation for them. And everything was for their own benefit. So actually for me and you, when you read the Bible, every word, every letter in the Bible is for my own benefit. So it's written for me. Every uh, prophecies are part of that. So were written for me. Yes, they may be, may, maybe they were written for the people of Israel at a certain time. Maybe they were written this for a specific king or for a prophet or something. But the spiritual meaning of the prophecy applies to everyone in every generation. And that's what we're going to see now today in the part that we're going to study. So every every word and every letter in the Bible, and Jesus said that the, 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 the heaven and earth are going to vanish or be destroyed, but a letter of my word is, is going to stay and or stand up. Okay? Okay. Uh, we're going to take an example, one of the reading that came in, in this week, or we're going to come in uh, during this week, and uh, it's very nice prophecy. Maybe when you read it, we'll get the impression that we're talking about, what is this? I don't understand anything. But probably when we get a little bit into it, we're going to see that it has a meaning and a very nice meaning. And then we're going to see that this meaning applies to me and you as Mona is bringing her question now. Yeah. So we're going to take this. And uh, please, when you go to the church and you attend it during the week and hear it, it's going to make the lamp you know, glow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is in uh, Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 9 and 10. Chapter 9 and chapter 10, from verse 8 in Isaiah 9 till the end of the chapter, and then four verses from verse 10. So it's one prophecy, it started in chapter 8, chapter 9, and ends at chapter 10. Okay, and it's starting from 9 8, verse 8 of chapter 9 till verse 4 of chapter 10. Let us read it uh, uh, the whole prophecy. And then uh, talk about it. Isaiah 9. Who got it? Someone? Someone? You got it? Good. Can, can you read with a loud voice? So can everybody understand? And, and a slow and loud. From verse 8? Yeah, verse 8 of chapter 9 till the end of the chapter, and then the four verses of chapter 10. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. The Lord sent a word against Jacob. Uh, this is good to, to know that mo all, most of the prophecies in the Old Testament started with the word, the Lord said, the Lord ordered me to do that, the Lord that, so it is the words of the Lord. 
And uh, probably if you go to the book of the Leviticus and uh, books of Moses, you will understand the Lord spoke to Moses and said, say that and tell the people. So actually the Lord is the one who's saying that. So whenever we read the prophecy and we don't understand, at least we know this is what the Lord said. If I understand it, good. If I don't understand, still pardon the words of the, the Lord said. Go ahead, have you? Sorry. The Lord sent the word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who stay in pride and arrogance of heart. The bricks will fa have fallen down, but we have rebuilt with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of reason against him and spur his enemies on the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elder and honorable, he is the head, the prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. Therefore, the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks fully. For all this, his, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns as the fire; it shall devour the briars and thorns, and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up. And the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh. Together they shall be against Judah. For all of this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune which they have prescribed, to rob the needy of justice, and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment, and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom, you, to whom will you flee for help, and where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out. Still. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Easy to understand. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> very, very much. Huh? Very easy. So if we read it another time, it's going to be easy? No. That is, it's okay. So you understand that. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. Did you notice anything about this paragraph? It is like uh, 15, 17 verse. About 17, 18 verse in total. Yeah. Did you notice anything about what we have read or heard now? Like you don't have to understand completely, but I mean, like, did you notice anything? I'm sure you noticed something, or something, you know, made the lamp uh, <laughs> grow for even a second, yeah. Sounds like a judgment. In... About judgment. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. they send it now, they're about to speak. Judgment for this. what? I do not know. <laughs> 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 judgment. Something. Okay. Sounds like... I, He's talking about, he talks about the fathers and the widows a lot, and he talks about the rulers a few times. So mm -hmm. it seems like the rulers were stealing from the widows and from the fatherless. Injustice. Injustice, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why he's really Something mad. that will require judgment. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Immediate judgment, long-term judgment. That's, all That's good. Know. So, you see, easy to understand. Yeah, yeah the hard good. reading I don't get. <laughs> <laughs> but still, okay. That's what I'm saying. Like, when you read a prophecy, you're not going to say, I didn't understand completely anything. No, but if you are really honest with yourself, you're going to see that you are understanding a lot. Mm-hmm. But we let us see that. Mina, what do you think? Did nothing. you get anything from that? No, I am nothing. I'm what I want. Okay, it's not a medical <laughs> book, <laughs> Taban, of course. Yes. <laughs> The word, that was a... <laughs> it's not a medical book here. <laughs> okay, other Mina. Um, I noticed that, like, I, the leaders thing kept standing up. Like, it's judgment on leaders. Like, I noticed the leaders kept standing up. Mm-hmm. And it's always somebody who's who's um, who's in a bad situation that the leaders are affected. Mm-hmm. I didn't really understand until they connected that. Bravo, bravo. That. Mm-hmm. And I also noticed that. Um, the first part of the second chapter, so chapter 10, was um, was him saying, like, woe to you who, who's generally, like, woe to you who speak evil or, or put evil on mm-hmm. people with your words. And I noticed, I, I noticed that was like a common theme in the entire thing. It kept building off of that. Okay. Verse. So it's the same like someone said, it's a judgment for injustice and things like that. Yeah. That which is great, great. Mona. Um, what well, overall, I see a lot of turmoil, like there's a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. But what caught my eyes is the sentence, but his hand is stretched out still. Bravo. Almost repeated a lot. Bravo. So there's a lot of problem, but I didn't get what the problem is. Bravo. Are. Bravo. But God is hover, hover, uh, God is existing, God sees it, God Bravo. is in control. Bravo. Hand, so you got something really, really important. Yeah, but here, I don't but know what the problem is. It's about. okay, but <laughs> this is like searching in the sands and find like a piece of gold. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, um, did you notice anything here or you understand something or got something? I guess one thing that kind of stood out to me is how specific they are about the people, how specific they are. Like it goes in and says like father like I guess Samuel pulled it up earlier. Yeah. It's, it's very specific like fatherless people or the elderly or just the children. Like it narrows it down to these Spain people. Being is like a, a special or something related to injustice, but in father and son whatever. Yeah, it's okay. That's good. Injustice will lead to a judgment. That's probably one thing we can we can agree that it is there. Okay, Justina, what do you what catch that catch your eyes in this? Yeah, the prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. Mm-hmm. And the, the prophet who teaches lies, he mm-hmm. is the tail. So mm-hmm. I, I recognize that maybe it's a prophecy about the Pharisees who are the leaders of the people and they're causing them to, mm-hmm. to sin. Um and also, I recognize the same as Mona, which is his hand is stretched out still, mm-hmm. like repeated. That so is good. These two, yeah. That is good. Like, uh, Amani and, and Jack, uh, did anything, uh, did you get anything from reading the prophecy here? This prophecy that we read now? You want to share with us? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. it's like, everyone else said it's about uh, judgment <laughs> because they have sinned and they they still don't want to repent and mm. yeah yeah good jack i agree with what everyone else said uh, that god cares very much about justice and cares uh-huh. that no, no one is forgotten of course god is just and he cares about justice that's good. That, okay. So at least, Yanni, when we read something like that, we, we, we can't say we got zero. Mm-hmm. Huh? We got zero understanding. We don't understand the word. Huh? Those seven of us are good. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> but at least, at least there is something that, you know, your eyes caught here and you got and you benefit. Okay. And that's what, what it means about the prophecy. Even if you, un- if you understand a little bit like that, it is good. It's good. Imagine, Shui, I'm going to ask you like that. Imagine now, now, if an angel from heaven came here and took you to heaven and told you you can go back again to the Bible study meeting, Yanni, 
but you can take one thing from here with you. How precious is that thing? A zolapa, a piece of a stone from the... <laughs> Incredibly from... precious, it's the most precious thing on earth. You know, when people went to the moon, moon here is just next door, <laughs> and when they brought some stones from there, they are putting it in, a, you know, in, in under, you know, glass uh, boxes and things like that, and doing that. It's just a stone from the moon, yeah, which is... <laughs> <laughs> but imagine yeah, you get like a little stone from the floors in heaven yeah. if there is a stone there I don't know <laughs> but it's going to be something very 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 precious even if it is just a stone from heaven yeah. hmm? so the same thing here okay even if you understand a word from the prophecy still that's good and it's great it's a holy thing it is remember as someone when he started to read we said yeah. and the Lord said so this is the words of the Lord. Whether by you understand or don't understand. Okay, the words of the Lord. You know, if, if, if they tell you now, Jesus is standing in front of Burger King here next door and talking there. Would you continue to sit here and to do anything? I'm sure we're going to jump and run, all of us, right? We want to hear you. And when we, we go there, we see Jesus talking in Hebrew, which is the language probably we don't understand the letter of it. All of us, she said we seven here or eight or whatever, yeah. Huh? But still, we're going to continue to listen and stay. Jesus is talking. Whether we understand or we don't understand, it's the word of the, of the Lord. So the prophecy is like that. So even if you understand a word, a simple meaning from that, it's great. Okay. But let us go more than this now. Okay. Uh, I like what Mona noticed here. That and I'm sure all of you have noticed this. This part here is like a poet, okay. And actually, it is a poet, and it has an ending of four verses or four parts, and each part of it ends with the same wording. Hmm? Same wording for all his for all this his for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And that is repeated four times. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Actually, this verse is repeated four times in those four, this, uh, this part, which divided into four paragraphs. Paragraph one, two, three, four. And we're going to see that each paragraph is leading to the next Okay, that has a meaning, and that's a meaning, and a meaning, and a meaning. And those four meanings are like four steps in a ladder or something, going from one, two, three, four. And each one of them ends with the same words, which is, if I don't understand the whole prophecy, it's enough to understand this verse. And it is written for me. If I, if I really read this verse, and, uh, oh, for all this, this could be this what I'm doing here. Hmm? For all this that I'm doing, Yanni, his anger is not turned away, which means that I'm still doing lots of wrong things, and his anger is not turned away. But, but, and we put um, put un, uh, underline this word with many letters. Yeah, I have lots of wrong doings, and these wrong doings makes God angry about me, and his anger is not turned away. Because God does not turn his anger for any reason unless I repent. Hmm? So if I offer sacrifices, if I do this, if I do that, and it's not repenting, the anger of God is still there. Right? The only thing that turns the anger of God is our repentance. Yeah? So maybe I'm not repented yet, and I'm still talking and saying and doing that for all this, that what am I saying and doing and that, his anger is not turned away. But even his anger is not turned away, his hand is still stretched out. <laughs> I think this verse alone, you can highlight it and under, uh, underline every word in it and probably write it in a piece of paper and put it in front of you in your room. That's a great hope and a wonderful thing to everyone in every generation, the people who are listening to Isaiah 1,000 years before Christ, and people who were living at the time of the incarnation of the Lord, 
and we are after 21 century of the birth of the Lord, that verse is still a great hope for all of us. Despite all of my wrongdoing and sayings and, de and terrible deeds and words that make God angry at me, but, but during this, he's still stretching his hand to me. And you know who's the one who's not accepting his hands? We. The, actually, there is another prophecy in Isaiah said before that eh, um, the Lord is, I have stretched my hand to people like uh, stubborn. stubborn or don't want to. Yeah. Yani, I am the one who's doing the, the wrong doing, and I'm still the one who is stubborn to stretch my hand to accept the stretched hand of the Lord. This verse describes my situation and the situation of everyone. And probably this is a great benefit. If we don't understand anything about the prophecy, it's enough to understand this verse. And the Lord repeated four times for us. So who doesn't understand from the first time? When I stand from the, <laughs> understand the second or the third or the fourth time, right? But anyway, we'll come to this verse that was repeated. Huh? But let us take one paragraph and try to understand it. Try to understand. Maybe we can. Hmm? Let us read the first paragraph. First paragraph is from verse uh, chapter 9, verse 8, till we reach this verse, but his hand is stretched out still, which is verse 12. So from verse 8 to 12, four verses. Let us read them and try to understand them and what, what they, they say. Okay, be sure you go ahead. From verse chapter 8 verse chapter 9 verse 8 till 12 four verses the lord sent a word against jacob and it has fallen on israel all the people will know as fine and the inhabitants of samaria who say in pride and arrogance of heart the bricks have fallen down but we will rebuild the hewn stone the sycamores are cut down but we will replace them with cedars Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezid against him and spur his enemies on, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let us take it verse by verse, those four verses, and try to understand them. First one, verse 8. And the Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. What does this mean? The word, the Lord has said a word against Jacob. Against here would carry a meaning. When this, the Lord says something against someone, that is a word of rebuke, a word of judgment, a word of hmm, harsh... Um, response to something bad that this person did, right? So Jacob here, what is Jacob and what is Israel here? So the Lord sent a word against Jacob and it has fallen on Israel. Jacob is Israel and Israel is Jacob, right? So what, what does the mean, what the Lord means here? The Lord said a word against Jacob. And it has fallen on Israel. If it's possible, it's like talking about the north, because I know the north is called Israel, the south is called Judah. But... That's Jacob here. Yeah. Well, and Jacob is Israel. Yeah, but I, I think go ahead. Talking about fallen Israel, the population of Israelites. Mm -hmm. But now, he's talking against Jacob. Mm -hmm. Jacob as a person. As a Person, but it's fallen on the population of. Mm, could be. Have <laughs> anybody has uh, tried to think about it? Yeah. Uh, hmm? Genesis here in the Bible. It says Genesis. Yeah. Chapter thirty-two. I'm gonna go to Genesis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, this chapter is when the Lord uh, fought with uh, Jacob. Okay. But go, go if you want to go and look at it. Yeah, yeah. It's good to. But was the prophecies in the Old Testament like a when a person would say something, you know, like when I said, yeah, yeah, 
you know that deacon who has a loud voice يعني يعني always you know push the others كده and try to <laughs> So the same thing here that the Lord probably will say something, you know, that everybody will understand the meaning. Yeah. Hmm? I'm talking about the deacon who has allowed us, who does this. Oh, oh yeah, he's sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't mean that. I'm just using this as an example. Yeah. Hmm? But maybe maybe this is something like that. Yeah. But okay, it's very good that you notice that. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> like, that you notice this in the verse. <laughs> I didn't use that example. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what did you did you what does this verse means to you? <laughs> Trying to understand it. Hmm. The Lord spoken as the Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. What is Jacob and what is Israel? As I told, Jacob is Israel. Israel is Jacob. Jacob was his name, and the Lord changed his name. When he told him, what is your name? Your name is no longer going to be Jacob. It's going to be Israel. So there is a point here that Jacob became Israel. What was this point? When he fought. Huh? When he fought. When he fought with God and won. Remember. And when he won, God allowed him to win. And then when he won, God changed his name to become Israel. What is the difference between Jacob and Israel in meaning the meaning of the word? Yeah, and when God changed his name to Israel, what is the meaning of Israel? What is the meaning of Israel? Yeah, and why God changed his name from Jacob to Israel? Doesn't it mean like so Google says God preserves, but I think it means like the one who wrestled and won with God, right? The one who wrestles with God. No, Israel doesn't mean that. God, Google says God preserves. God perseveres. Hmm? God perseveres. Say it again. Sorry. God perseveres. Like God God persevering. Does. Anyway, whatever the meaning is, you can search for it, but it's like God kind of rewarding him. For fighting with him and winning. Right? And God allowed him to fight and to win and rewarded him by changing his name to Israel. Israel means like uh, more blessing, more, you're not like one nation, you're nations. You're not one person, you are a kingdom. Right? So if we take this meaning now and apply it to this verse here, the Lord spoke a word of judgment against one person or that, but it falls on the whole nation, which means like hey, the Lord is saying here, what I'm saying is not for one person, it's for everyone. What will come here is a warning or judgment or whatever the meaning of the word, Yani, but it is for everyone in Israel, not only Jacob, only not one person, but the person who became a nation or wrong. So you got it now. Somebody asked it here, is that uh, for all of us or for some people? Mona, I think I asked that. It's the prophecy for one person or the people who listen or for everyone. I think this verse up, up, tell us this, yeah. So the word said a word of judgment to Jacob, uh, or against Jacob as a person. Or the person who was doing injustice, like in the example that will follow here. But remember, this judgment is not for that person alone. It's for me and you and everyone, even when we live in different generation. Which means that the word of judgment here against Jacob is not only against Jacob, it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. So if it happens that I, who lives 20 centuries or 30 centuries after Jacob, okay, and I do the same thing like Jacob did here, that this warning comes upon me too, right? So, so the Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel, on everyone. Eba al word of against the idea. Let us read the next verse nine. 
Who's reading that? I think uh, all the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria. Okay. So I, I think the Lord explained it here. Yeah. I think everybody knows himself. So, the, which means like the judgment I'm going to say now against Jacob is not for Jacob alone. It's for everyone. You know yourself. I know myself and I know that this word is for me. The people in inhabitants of Ephraim and Samaria and everyone. Yeah. So it comes to everyone, which means that this word of judgment here or word against Jacob is not against Jacob as a person and it's not against Israel as a nation, but it's for everyone in every generation that would be doing the same thing like what will come here. Okay. In the back. Next. Um, yeah, still verse 9 here, that all the people will know, Ephraim will know, yani all the people means here Ephraim and all the others, Ephraim and all the inhabitants of Samaria, they will know that they are meant by this verse, which means like Ephraim and Samaria and Ajax and uh, Toronto and uh, all Canada of Canada, and every, you name it, all the people everywhere, yani they will know themselves that, oh, this word is against me too, okay? And um, who mean who are those people that who say pride and arrogance of heart? What does this mean by? Mean all those people that who say and pride and, uh, and arrogance of heart, say a al Yani, when those people say something in pride and arrogance, which means all of us, we do that and say that many times every day, right? So this word is for, now we can understand the word that came to Jacob, falling on Israel, and everybody in Samaria and there, and there they understand that this word is against them too. Who are the people who say, or, or those people who say in pride and arrogance, what, what are they saying there? Let us see verse next verse, verse 10. Mina. The bricks are falling down, but we will rebuild the hewn stones. The ah. stones. Come, come. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Hello, Khas. What does this mean? The brick have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hard stones. The sycamore are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. That verse needs some dictionaries to <laughs> interpret the words, but it, the meaning is uh, wonderful. Uh, huh? This is like the Tower of Babel kind of thing? Exactly. So they say here, those people who speak, those people who say in pride and arrogance of heart, People who say things in pride and arrogance of heart. It's me. And lots of time I do that. I say things in pride, false pride, of course, and arrogance of heart. So this example for that, those people said, hey, the bricks have fallen down. So what? We're going to build with hard stones. Bricks is this normally, that is, uh, you know, these blocks that are made of clay. Which, like, you know, when you put them in for a while, some water come up on them, they just can melt and uh, we're, we're, we're down here. Yeah. So it's like they are building a wall. And God is telling them now, see, your wall is falling because it is weak. It's not planned right. Huh? Some water came and made it to, made it to fall down. The, the natural response is I said, oh, it's my mistake. I forgot to build a good one with the stones like I should, you know correct what I did. No, I will say in arrogance of heart, so what? The bricks fall. I'm going to bring stones and build it with stones. So I'm going to keep the wall between me and you. So it's started first by a arrogance of heart to say to the Lord, well, I'm going to build the wall between me and you, which means like I'm going to listen to any word that you're going to say. And even if this wall fall down because it is weak and not planned right, I'm going to build another one more stronger than it. 
Like when God will tell you, repent, you see the, the voice of the Holy Spirit, say, repent, repent. Say, no, I'm not going to repent. I have done this, I'm going to do this and this. Unfortunately, not the people in the Old Testament who did that, but in every generation, people do that. Mm -hmm. So as what I said, the prophecy has a direct meaning for the people who listen at that time, but it has a meaning that extends to generations and many places and many people. That's why when anyone reads the prophecy at any generation or at any place, he's going to say, oh, it's talking about me. Hmm? So this is talking here about the arrogance of heart. And even when I know that what I did is not standing, it's not good, but I don't correct it, I make it even worse. I continue to be stubborn and say, okay, the, the bricks fall because they are clay and, and you know soft. I'm going to bring hard stones and build the wall between us and don't listen to your voice. And then the sycamore tree were cut down. Sycamore is a gymnasium, the sugar gymnasium. It's a kind of trees that has a wood. Their wood is not that, it's a very cheap wood. Yeah, or like this is made of uh, sycamore wood, yeah, something yeah, very bad colors. Yeah. And uh, this, this is always cut and get broken easily. But they say, no, no, no we're going to bring cedars. Cedars, the low and sugar, uh, the, the trees that go high and level. This is the perfect uh, kind of wood. Remember the temple, the Solomon built the temple. Well, he brought sycamore trees from Lebanon to build the temple. Yeah. So which means like I built a wall between me and God. So I don't want to listen to his voice. Okay. And this was from I, uh, wood that I, uh, nothing yet. Yeah. And this wood is, is cut now. But I said, no, no, no don't worry. I'm going to bring better wood to build a wall against between you and me. So I don't listen to your voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, this is arrogance of heart. Arrogance of heart doesn't have a time. We can't say that the people of the time of Moses or time of uh, Isaiah had arrogance of heart. But now people are have a very soft, kind heart. Can we say that? <laughs> so I think that's something that applies to everyone in every generation. Yeah. And, and us included. Yeah. So that is the meaning here. Yeah. Let's see the verse now. Verse 10. It says, the bricks have fallen down. God is saying that, and he's saying that to the people who in pride and arrogance of heart say the, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with heaven uh, stones. And the sycamore are cut down, but we, are, we will replace them with cedars. Hmm? Next, verse 11. Uh, Justina, go ahead. Um. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies on. That's that very good. <laughs> Who is resin me? R E Z I N. This is the name of a person. Yeah, we Googled it. Huh? We Googled it okay, and you found? He's a king of Damascus. King of Damascus, and he was a very stubborn king that was a kind of enemy to Israel. And uh, you remember when uh, Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha prophesied against him and he died later. Yeah. So he was a very um, bad enemy to the people of Israel. And he was like uh, representing like uh, annoying neighbor that always attacking them. And uh, so it's here the, 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 the response of the Lord to not listening to him. And being stubborn in that, that the, the Lord will do what here in this, uh, in, in this verse. Therefore, the Lord shall set up. Allah He's not coming to attack me. But the Lord is doing that. So you're going to see some enemies coming. And those enemies are really annoying and stronger than me. Huh? Who made them to come to attack me? Is it because they are bad? No. Yes, they are bad, of course, yeah. But who brought them to attack me? The Lord did that. So Razin here is, is like the Lord is sitting up 
the adversaries against those people of arrogance of heart and the false of pride like that. And that will happen everywhere. Do you have any example of today, Masa? Well, I have a question. Could we talk I'm asking bit? a question. I need an answer. <laughs> so I'm your question. Yeah. Well, if you're asking a question, you can only... <laughs> anyway, that question is, is for all of us. Think of it. If you have any example of today, like, you know, you can say, go ahead, hello. But, but anyway. <laughs> we talked about it before, but God using, like, evil nations to, you know, discipline Israel mm -hmm. because he uses this person. Yes, not and many times it happens in the Old Testament. Yes. Like God brought the people of Babylon, God brought the people of uh, Assyria, which, which are those who people were worshipping yes. idols. Yes. But they were the tools in the hand of God to punish and to uh, chastise the people of Israel. So then why would God use evil tools then? Why wouldn't he use, you know, a good... Okay. Do you have any answer to this question? Like, uh, it's like a father. Why God would use those people to do that? It's a father disciplining his child. No, but uh, what he meant here, before he meant that, uh, why God use an evil person to chastise one of his children? It would be like if, like, the way I think of it is, if I wanted to get revenge on somebody, so I hired a criminal to get revenge. Well, okay, the criminal is also not good. So, like, for okay. me, it, it's all, like... You are going to hire the criminal to do this. Yes. But God doesn't do that. Okay, so what's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the way I'm thinking it is, yes. instead of God hiring, the way I see it is like, go back, going back to that father and son uh, scenario, it's like the son going to um, join like a gang club or something. And the father's just telling him no. But after so much stubbornness, just not listening, the father just... There's not much more he can say, and eventually he'll learn on his own that he's going to get himself killed at some point or in jail. You know what I mean? Mm. He abandoned him to his yeah. adversaries. Yeah, like he had, he gave him so many warnings, like no tomorrow. But that's not what it's saying here. It's saying the Lord will set him up. I mean, God is preparing this person to attack Israel, and God is allowing it. Like, and we know that this person is not good. Mm -hmm. that. So it's just. He's protecting them. No longer there's any protection. That's not what it's saying. It's saying he's setting him up. He's, he's preparing him to attack him. I mean, unless I'm reading it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're reading right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain that to him? Anybody want to explain that to Bishu? I don't know. Go ahead. I just, I just have a thought. I, I don't okay, know. okay. It's it just to humble the Israelites. To humble them Rough. so when because in previously they know when gods kind of let go they get defeated so when god let go of his hand then the enemy will defeat them so it would hum it, it would allow the israelite to know that god is upset or mm -hmm. angry actually there is a verse in the old testament says something like that that god is telling the people when you see yourself thousands of you fleeing in front of one of the enemy, you know that the Lord left you. Like when you see that thousands of you are running in front of one of your enemy, then you know that the Lord left you. Because the opposite will happen if the Lord is with you. One of you is going to fight a thousand of his enemy. So he's saying that you know that the Lord left you. So what did the people, what did the Lord do here? He left them. That's setting them against their enemy. The Lord is protecting them from their enemy. And when he left his hand, what? that is the word setting up people against you. Exactly like when you enter a room full of light and you switch light off. You brought darkness. Yeah. Did you intend to break, bring the darkness? No. <laughs> yeah. See the, the way I think of it, it's like God is saying when I'm setting them up, it's like okay, I am giving this man resin, I'm giving him the sword to go attack Israel. So the way I think of it is okay, this man is evil, and I know that. So giving him a sword to do evil against Israel, even though it's punishing them, even though it's discipline for their benefit, mm -hmm. you're still not like. Like you are talking, you are talking about one way of setting up 
Yeah, I, I think I think you're you're stuck on the word set up. Yeah. It's yeah. it's not set up like God has put the, the, the army together. Set up means you just let him do what he wants. It's not like setting up like tell him go ahead, kill them. He just you know when the Lord uh, let Satan test Job. Do you think that the Lord intended to hurt Job? No. But he let he let Satan to do whatever he want to do to prove that Job is a righteous person. And the end showed that. Right? So it doesn't mean that the Lord made Satan to hurt Job in order. No. But he let, he got give him an opportunity to do this. And by doing that, it looks to us that Job was hurt. But at the end, no, it's not hurt. It's actually the Lord showed how Job was a very righteous person and deserved to take double of everything here on earth and then the heaven again. So that's when we say the Lord set up or did or something, you know, then you should understand. Another thing here, you have to understand the meaning of the name, one of the names of the Lord, Pantokrafor. What is the meaning of this word? When we say God is the Pantokrafor. Pan to Krapur. Dabit al kul. Dabit al What does this me name mean? Uh, he's in control. Yeah. Yeah? He's in control. He is in control of every thing. And the Pan to is like a... Think of the watch. The watch is full of gears inside there. And then one gear will turn is the other one, and this hour and turn is this, and that by doing that, the watch will show the time. And by the way, the time now is 8.20, so we are near then. <laughs> okay. But these things are working perfectly. This gear is moving in a certain velocity, and this gear is moving then, and then you do that. Okay. If a little part of it doesn't work right, the whole watch is not working. So the Pantocrator is Lord. The Lord is controlling the whole universe. Every gear is doing its own movement. So there is an evil gear and a good gear, etc., etc. But the Lord is controlling that and using the movement of the old, of the of the of the bad gear with the good gear, etc. If there is a bad, I'm going again. Like I mean, like Judah wanted to betray the Lord and deliver him to the hands of the Jews. The Lord used that for our salvation. Does this mean that Judas has a good intention? No. He had a bad intention. He was doing whatever he's doing. Not knowing that this is going to benefit everybody. Right? But he was doing whatever he was doing. And then he regretted that and went and killed himself. But the Lord, the Pantocrator, used the betrayal of Judas. And can all the fear or the cowardice of Pilatus. Uh, and the uh, hate of the Jewish people and made from these bad things our salvation. Yeah, and he put Judas, put the Jews, and put the Romans. Everybody was doing one thing according to their intention. Their intentions were all bad. But the Lord made these bad things work together for our salvation. And there is a nice verse in the Romans 8.28. I'm sure all of you remember this verse. All things work for good for those who love God. Or actually the right translation of this verse. The Lord works in all things for good for the people who love God. All things means good things and bad things. You may have like a supervisor who hates you. And God will use this to move you to another part in the property that will be very good for you and things like that. So actually, this supervisor meant something bad for you, but the Lord turned that for something good for you because he is the Pantocrator that he doesn't do good only, but he can even change a bad thing to become good. Okay? So that you, you can that will bring this meaning here. But let us go back again to this here. That uh, therefore, uh, and we're talking here about the people who have pride and arrogance of heart, who said to the Lord that we're building a wall, we don't want to hear you or have a relationship with you. And if this wall made of brick is falling down, we're going to build with the stones like I'm stubborn 
in whatever I'm doing. And, and therefore, the Lord will set up the adversaries of reason against you and spur his enemies on. Like he, he, he will set your, your enemies and spur them, like give them power to overcome you. Okay. When they would actually, this is a nice verse in the, in, repeated many times in the Bible, that is the Lord. The Bible didn't mention that the Lord against every sinner, even the one committing adultery or worshiping idol. God is not against those people. But the only sin that will make God against the person is which? Hmm? The Bible mentioned huh? arrogance. Arrogance, yeah, the arrogance. Uh, those people who are feeling um, arrogant, yeah, okay. Those the Lord is against them, and then it's clear from this verse too. So, those people were uh, arrogant and stubborn, and they insisting on not listening. So, the Lord support his enemy, those enemies against them, empowered them to overcome them. And it happened that the Syrian, verse 12, the Syrians, who are the people led by uh, Rasin, lower Rasinda, uh, the Syrians before and the Palestinians behind, which means like will make the enemies from front and back. Wow. Pity on this person, يعني, who became, you know, that uh, the target of the enemies from everywhere. And those enemies are spurred against him by God. But this person is the one who's saying here, remember, the, the brick have fallen down. I'm going to replace them by stones. Like I'm insisting on not listening or not being there. And the beauty of the ending of this paragraph, let's say, uh, verse 12 is saying the Syrians before and the Palestinians behind. Enemies from front and enemies from back. And they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. Devour with open mouths reminds us of what? Yeah. Devour with an open mouth. Devil? Lion? <laughs> Lion? Huh? Lion? Bravo, yeah. Lion garb kada taruh al zoo with arab man al lion kada with how to make the idak. So he's saying that will be Israel, the people of Israel here, or those people who are arrogant and have false pride, etc., etc. The Lord is going to do this to them. They are going to be in front and back from enemies, and those enemies are going to devour them with an open mouth, like a lion open his mouth to devour them. Right? Easy thing to understand now. So this paragraph, the first paragraph, let us give it a title here. The arrogance of heart. When the arrogance of heart takes the person, now we're not talking about people in thousand years before Christ at the time of Isaiah. We're not talking about people in any generation, but in our generation today. That's why I ask the question here: Can you give any example like this? I have lots of examples like that. There are leaders of some nations in our recent history that probably this was applied to them. Mm. Yeah. They started with arrogance and false pride, and they left, refused to listen to the voice of the Lord and the start, and then enemies came from back and front and they destroyed them. There are people also who had lots of big words to say against the God, and, again, and then they ended up with, with this. So actually, these words here, we can put a title here that the arrogance of heart was false pride. Refusing to listen to the Lord, building a wall between the person and God, and being stubborn not to repent will lead to the enemies from everywhere and the destruction by devouring all the lion who was opening his mouth to do this. It was applied to the Jews, it was applied to the Romans, and applied to many. Yani, you can see it in people even in our today life here. Yeah. Okay. But the beauty of this prophecy here is this verse here. For all this, and actually all this is making us angry, right? Not making God only angry, huh? but it's making God angry and making us angry. 
right? When we see a person who's doing that, it will make us angry, right? And it makes God angry. But the difference between us and God, when we get angry, we revenge. Or at least if we can't revenge, we'll be sad. Right? But God is not like that. When God is angry because of the sin and the evil of the people, he stretched his hand. He's still angry because the people didn't repent. But he's stretching his hand and telling them, the door is open. And I'm still stretching my hand, waiting for you to stretch your hand to me. And actually, it's another verse, as I, I said it before, that the Lord stretched his hand to the stubborn people, the people of Israel, all the day. Like the Lord continued the whole day stretching his hand and they refusing to accept this open invitation from the Lord. And not only the people of Israel, today we do the same thing. Today we do the same thing. We live in arrogance and pride and false pride and do exactly here and refuse to listen to the Lord. And when the wall between God and us is, is worn down, or no, we build another one and we stubborn to, to listen. And the Lord will make the enemies come from front and back and say, Oh, I have a bad supervisor at work, I have a bad teacher at school, I have a sheriff, I have a. a. No, it's not the, the school or the teacher or the supervisor or all. It is the stubborn of my arrogant heart that makes everybody an enemy to me maybe they don't mean, mean to that but this is for me because because of that but the beauty here is that for all this his anger is not turned away why because there is no repentance yet but even during that the lord is but his hand is stretched out still so the first paragraph is the arrogance of heart the Second paragraph is talking about refusing to repent, which is continued to that. Third paragraph is, is talking about when the sin becomes a second nature. And these are, like I, I told you in the beginning, is like levels of ladder. Yeah? You move from refusing to, yeah, yeah, well, refuse, not, not, I don't want to repent because I see what am I doing is good. And then I and understand that what am I doing is not good. And repentance is a good way to, out of it, but I still refuse to repent. Okay, And then after a while continuing like that, it, sin becomes like a second nature. And I do sin because it is second nature to me. And then the last uh, paragraph is talking about when the person is going into sin as a second nature, his eyes will be blind that can't see the right from the wrong. And, that. and these are natural steps for living in sin. It is a, in the beginning, I know it's a sin, but I see that still taste good. I enjoy. Now, when I see that it is a sin and God is not happy with it, but I still refuse to repent. And then when I continue and refusing to repent and just said, no, 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 it becomes like a second nature. And this second nature will lead to spiritual blindness. But in all these four steps, the same word is repeated. The same word is repeated after four, those. For all this, the anger is not, his anger is not turned away because there is no repentance yet. But his hand is stretched out still. And even when the person reaches the level of spiritual blindness, blindness about God and about his word and about all things he belongs to God, at that situation, still the hand of the Lord stretched his breath. So what do you think about this prophecy now? No, I mean... <laughs> 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 As a lamp here and growing. Right? Clear as mud. Clear as mud. Clear as mud. Clear as mud. <laughs> God bless you, Habib. Now, these are the prophecies. I, I just meant to bring this prophecy to tell you. It looks, hmm, you remember when we read it the first time? I don't understand anything. What is this? And that's normally what we do when we read the prophecies like that. But when we go into 
trying to understand it. And it needs a dictionary or again, it needs going back and forth between verses that, but you're going to see in it a direct meaning for the people of Israel at that time. Yes, Isaiah was prophesying against to the people of Israel who were doing this exactly, right? But it has a, 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 a far meaning behind that that applies to everyone in every generation, including me and you and everyone here. And the clever person, the smart person, but is a person who would read and understand and benefit from his word and uh, see these encouraging verses. Yani, I would say this encouraging verse here that for all this, and this could, you could put anything under it, his anger is not turned away because there is no repentance yet. But even, even in this situation, his hand is stretched out. I think that reflects one of the verses that St. Paul said, is while we are still sinners, Jesus died for us. He didn't wait for us to become good and then die for us. No, while we are still sinners, he died for us. God bless you all. And uh, maybe it's in a quick uh, few minutes, given two, three minutes. And we need three volunteers to tell us something you benefited from uh, this prophecy or whatever we did tonight. Yeah. Something we can take home. Mm. Who's the first volunteer? William, Marie, go ahead. Well, I, I want to go back to what you just said, though. Whatever, whatever you benefited from that, I, <laughs> and I hope everybody benefits something. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I did benefit a lot. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Harry. Well, I mean, you just said Jesus died for us while we're still sinners. Well, I, you said Jesus died for us while we're still sinners. Mm. I sometimes struggle with the idea because. Um, I feel like I have to prove myself when I go, um, what if I go to confession, I have to come up with at least, oh, but at least I did this good thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe that'll compensate for the rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I'll try and- I'll try yeah, Actually, and you brought a very good, uh, good point here. Is that in order to gain a lot from God, you don't try to look good. Actually try to look even worse than what you are. Yani, uh, there is one of the psalms that we read in the end of the prayer of the prime, last psalm in the prime. Mm -hmm. I think uh, like when David want to get more mercy from God, he's saying, oh, because I have lots of sins. And actually, now, uh, someone would tell you, oh, you did this wrong. No, 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 it's not this, it's just this or this. Yeah, I try to minimize it. But actually, when you do that with God, Try to maximize it, not to minimize it. Because when you maximize your sin, you're going to maximize the mercy of God that you're going to receive for that. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you, Javi. This is very nice. Man. Okay, uh, second volunteer. Two weeks in a row you did Anyway. Yeah, someone. <laughs> What I've benefited the most, probably as we mentioned four times, like thousands of times actually in this Bible study, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still, which means there's, it's never too late to offer repentance. Bro. Even when all this, all this means, Yani, hmm? did everything. There is nothing I didn't do. Right? But even with this, yeah, his anger is not turned away because I haven't repented yet, but still his hand stretched. That's very good, Solomon. And, and actually, actually, if we get out of this, only this verse was repeated four times, that would be great, yeah. But uh, we get more into that. Third volunteer. Who's uh, going to be sir? Mona, go ahead. We're, we are a human, are hopeless, but God never gave, gave up on us. Mm -hmm. Bravo. This is another thing of seeing that that even when we reach this level of being hopeless, but still, we may lose the hope for ourselves, but God will never give up on us. He still think that or wait for us to repent and come back. 
that's a beautiful meaning يعني, or a thing we can see in this but I'm sure the prophecy here has many many other uh, beneficial ideas and things and probably if you go and read it again and read the other parts that we didn't uh, talk about them yet I just told you that the titles together quickly, but they have the same thing. Yeah. Uh, if you go and see that, oh, I'm sure the fir- first impression, oh, this is me. It's talking about me. And see the steps here that would lead from one level to the other, to other, and that. And still, with every level, the hand of the Lord still stretched to save me. God bless you, Al-Habib. I'm going to have a